just want to walk out over everything that happens, lose all that money, go back to knocking heads. Mike, that's not what I'm saying. No, Mike, we just say it ain't fair. Now look, we've got a contract and a grievance procedure to make things fair. You want to go back to the old ways? Well, that's why it's our duty to see to it that the wage agreement works. A brief conversation held deep within the earth. The expression of a grievance and the need to make things fair. It's a conversation that could be heard anywhere Americans gather to work. The mine, the factory, the warehouse, the state house, the schoolhouse. To make things fair, a simple idea, an often difficult task, a powerful responsibility. Now this program is designed to help you learn the basic principles of handling grievances. Even though we will look at the subject through the eyes of the union representative, the principles apply just as much to supervisors. For successful grievance handling, like all encounters within the collective bargaining process, is a shared responsibility. It requires an understanding by both union and management representatives. We began in the mine. What we will see and hear is an adaptation of a program originally developed for the United Mine Workers of America. You may hear terms that seem unfamiliar, unique to mine workers, like wage agreement instead of contract or labor agreement. But keep in mind, whether you're a mine committee man, a steward, a patrolman, a griever, or a building rep, the job of handling grievances is basically the same. There was a time in this country when a grievance almost always led to conflict. Perhaps it was part of this country's growing pains, but whatever it was, it was painful. Wildcat strikes, pitched battles. The conflict over grievances nearly tore us apart, and the scars were a long time healing. But over the years, reason prevailed. We learned to fight at the table instead of in the streets. We worked out agreements to provide a method of solving problems between labor and management. Yet problems still occur. Grievances and complaints of unfairness or injustice. It's a fact of the human condition. So we created the grievance procedure to provide a safety valve, an orderly process for legitimate complaints, to maintain open lines of communication between labor and management, and to provide for continuing operation during the grievance process. The key phrase here is orderly process. The more effective we are at mastering the principles of administering the grievance procedure, the more likely we are to avoid the problems which plagued us in the past. For those of you who will handle grievances, it's important at the outset to look at the grievance procedure not only as a desirable alternative to conflict, but as a critical responsibility. As in all life, rights and responsibilities are inseparable partners. So what are the basic responsibilities of those who handle grievances? The most important responsibility of anyone handling grievances is to know and understand your agreement. This uh, insignificant little booklet, the contract or labor agreement, is the law. The law that the majority of the membership ratified and management accepted. You know something? It's pretty thorough. It lays down the law for just about every kind of official activity in the workplace. Let's see, is work jurisdiction, management rights, right to a safe workplace, ship rotation, holidays, vacation, seniority, and so on. It's there, you ought to take a look. In fact, you'll never be much of a local union representative or a management representative until you know and understand this book cover to cover. It's to be studied and analyzed and referred to constantly. And this brings us to your second responsibility. You must be a problem solver. It's up to you to resolve problems based upon the principles agreed upon in your contract. Your third responsibility is to research the problem thoroughly. Get out all the facts, talk to everyone involved. Clearly identify and understand the issues. Once you identify and understand the issues, the solution to the problem cannot be far behind. You'll be administering the law on the front line on a day-to-day -day basis through the grievance procedure written up right here in the labor agreement. Hold it. I said this was the labor agreement, didn't I? Well, 
I'm one third right, but only one third. There are two more parts. The written agreement is negotiated between the employer and the union. That's only part one. When that written agreement is put to the test through the final step of the grievance procedure, arbitration, those decisions form a body of case law which interprets the written agreement as it applies to specific situations. This body of case law becomes part two of the labor agreement. Finally, there may be a third part, past practice. In some contracts, when something has been done a certain way for a long period of time, when both sides are aware of it, this past practice becomes a part of the labor agreement too. Put those three things together and you have the working agreement. And it's that whole business the parties have to administer. It's a tough job. It's an important job, which is basically why we're here, you and I, to learn how to get it done with the know-how and the professionalism it deserves. Grievances are a part of every workplace environment. As frontline contract administrators, you'll be dealing with grievances on a regular basis. A successful resolution depends on how well you learn to deal with grievances. Now, we're, we're not just going to turn you loose and say, go to it, no. If you're to be effective, you've got to understand that grievance procedure inside and out, and that'll be the subject of this segment. Let's uh, take a look at a typical grievance procedure. As you can see, this typical grievance procedure consists of four steps. Yours may be slightly different. Some have three steps, some have five. Whatever the case, though, these are the basic steps. Ideally, though, progressing through the steps should be something that's rarely done. It's more advantageous for both management and the union to solve each grievance at the earliest possible step. The more time spent on a grievance, the more costly the process. Time is money, you know. Anyway, step one of this procedure occurs between the employee with or without the union representative and the foreman. If the employee feels the agreement has been violated, it is his responsibility to first discuss it with his foreman and union representative. If they can work things out at this step, that's great. As a matter of fact, this is where we'd like most of the grievances to be settled. However, if they can't work things out, the grievance progresses to step two, right here. In this step, the union refers the grievance to a higher level of management. What this consists of is the union representative writing up the grievance on an official form and submitting it to management. Both parties have to try to resolve the matter. And again, from a cost standpoint, it's all for the better if that can be done at this step. If resolution can't be reached, though, the grievance progresses to, you got it, step three. Step three gets different people involved, probably the field representative and a higher company representative. At this step three meeting, each side tries to be as persuasive as possible, but open-minded and objective in considering the merits of the case and at arriving at an equitable solution. They engage in argument and counter-argument. And if a solution can be found that both sides can live with, the grievance procedure ends at this step. If agreement can't be reached, however, the grievance continues on to step four, arbitration. In arbitration, an outside arbitrator, that is, someone not connected with either the union or management, is selected by the parties to hear the case. This meeting is held much like a court case, except less formally. Usually, the decision reached by the arbitrator is final and binding. This, then, is the typical grievance procedure. Remember these four steps. They will apply to most grievances you run across. In your dealings with grievances, you'll find that sometimes things don't go as well as you'd like. As contract administrators, you have to deal with the problems. How you deal with them will determine, to a great degree, how well the workplace functions. Your problems even have their own specific name. They're called grievances. And before you even begin to take action, you've got to determine whether or not it's a grievance. 
Beginning with this segment, you'll see how a grievance is handled from the viewpoint of the grievance committee man, in this case, Mike Duncan. You'll see the thought process he goes through, what he looks for, all of that. The whole situation started on the Tuesday before the annual vacation. Lynette Little found it first. She happened to be walking by the bulletin board when, wait, well, tell you what, let, let's watch. Say, Elmer, did you read this yet? Hmm. You need two mechanics and a welder to work during vacation. Sounds like a good deal. I know, but they only need two mechanics. You've got more seniority than me. You gonna do it? And I sure could use the money. Yeah, I'd like to work, but I gotta check with the rest of the crew first. I don't have that much more seniority than you do, you know. Hey, come here. Have you read this? Huh. Hmm. You think you're gonna sign up? Oh, I really could use the money. But I was looking forward to fishing. <laughs> Oh, uh, what the hell, though? Yeah, sure, I'm gonna do it. Same with me. I can get ahead of the bills for a change. Well, they only need one welder. That's me. Well, you guys got the seniority. I guess that's settled. Yeah, I suppose so. If you guys are gonna sign up, I'm not even gonna waste my time. You got the seniority, you get the job. A common occurrence. A request for overtime workers during vacation. Senior people get the job. It's a past practice at this company. But uh, let's see what happens after vacation. Uh, Elmer, you catch up on your sleep? Ha! You can't sleep until noon when you gotta get the roof fixed. And work in a little time for fishing. See what I'm gonna do. Vacation just to rest off my vacation. Yeah. <laughs> How'd it go around here? Did Earl work you to the bone? Uh, yeah, he worked us all right. Not as much as he worked himself. Hey, remember when he dropped that wrench? I like to bust a gut. <laughs> oh, man. Wrench? What are you guys talking about? <laughs> well, when we got around to cleaning the rotary dump, Mr. Earl Cantrell finally figured there was too much work for just us guys to do. Hey, you, you know how he shakes when Rocky Foster's around. I mean, he'd like to tell The Rock that he didn't get the work done about as much as he'd like a case of the smallpox. <laughs> yeah, yeah, really. So it turned Turned out to be just one of the boys, Mr. Earl Cantrell. Well, that's for sure. Oh, I'm just glad he doesn't work on this crew all the time. Yeah, we'd never get any work done. That is not right. He is not supposed to be doing our work. Oh, sounds like you ought to have a little talk with him, Elmer. Well, you're damn right I will. You, uh, you looking for me? Yeah, you got a minute? Sure, Elmer, what's up? Guys and I were talking this morning, and, uh, he said something about you working on the dump last week. Well, the guys were wrong. I didn't work on the dump. Well, the guy said you dropped a wrench while you were working on the dump. Now, if you weren't working, what were you doing with a wrench? Look, Crawford, I didn't work last week. I just helped the guys out, you know, here and there. Yeah, I think your here's and there's are taking work away from us, namely me. <laughs> what the hell are you talking about, taking work away from you? You didn't even sign up for the job. What I was going to until I found out the other guys were going to. They got more seniority than me, so I knew they'd get it. Look, Crawford, I can't run this crew on what a man was going to do. Now, next time you want to work, you apply. I'll see what I I'm can do. I'm not worried about next time. I'm worried about this time. You took work away from me, and I want to get paid for it. Look, you're making a big stink out of nothing. Earl, I am asking you to pay for those shifts. No way. OK, it looks like I'm just going to have, have a little discussion with Mike Duncan this afternoon. You do that. Elmer's upset, all right. That's the way a grievance begins. A worker has a complaint. Elmer tried to talk to Earl about his problem, and that's the first step, talking to the foreman. It's always best to try to settle these things at the lowest level. But Elmer didn't get any satisfaction from Earl. So he's decided to see what Mike Duncan, his mine committee man, can do to help resolve the matter. Look, if I had known they were going to need a third mechanic, I would have signed up for the job. Sure. sure. Cantrell's not supposed to be doing classified work. No way. Right. Mike, you're the mine committeeman. Mm-hmm. You're supposed to take care of our complaints, right? Yeah. Well, I've got a complaint. I want you to do something about it. Hey, Elmer, calm down, OK? Hey, you know, we can't talk about it here. Why don't you meet me after work at the diner? Elmer's got a complaint, all right. He's sure that Earl has performed classified work. But what Mike has to find out is if he's got a legitimate grievance, something worth taking up his time, the company's time, and the union's time. The first thing he's got to do is gather as many facts about the complaint as he can. This involves several steps. 
But the first and most important is interviewing witnesses. There are six key questions I want you to think about while you watch Mike interview these witnesses. Who is the grievant and who are the others involved? What really happened? When did the violation or condition occur? Where did the grievance take place? Why is the grievance really a grievance? How should the injustice be corrected? Let's watch now. So what's on your mind, Alvin? It's like this, Mike. You remember when the company posted a notice right before vacation saying that they need two mechanics and a welder to work during vacation? Mm -hmm. I would have worked. I would have canceled my vacation. But I knew that Walter and Richard both were going to apply for the mechanics job, and they've both been working here longer than I have, so I didn't even bother to apply. So what's your problem? The problem is that Earl Cantrell did classified work during vacation when he was just supposed to be supervising. If I'd known they were going to need a third mechanic, I would have applied. And I, I could have gotten the job because I was next in line. Now, it just don't seem right that Earl did that work. But did you talk to Earl about it? Sure, I talked to him. He wouldn't admit to anything. It sounds like you got a legit complaint. But I'm going to have to check it out. Yeah. Check with Walter and Richard and Frank. And another thing, Mike, another thing, I've got a legitimate complaint. I want the company to pay me for 10 regular eight-hour shifts, just like they'd paid me if I'd worked. Okay, we'll get to it. Mike's got a good start. At least he's identified the problem, and he knows that Elmer tried to discuss his complaint with Earl. That was his first step. Now he has to proceed with investigating the grievance. As a conscientious committee man, he knows he's got to do a lot of investigating to see if what Elmer says can be verified by other witnesses. Let's see how Mike continues to answer those six questions. Now, maybe Elmer's blowing the whole thing out of proportion. Hey, Mike, how you doing? Hey, fine, Frank. So you got a minute or two to talk? Well, yeah, sure, what's up? Well, Elmer's all upset. He thinks Earl did some mechanics work during vacation. So you might know something about it. Well, yeah, he's got every right to be upset. Oh, where does a foreman get off doing classified work? Hey, that's right. They're all ain't supposed to be doing classified work. Hey, hey, you guys want to hold on a minute? I'm just trying to get the facts. And just hold the emotions for a while. Now, exactly what did Earl do? Well, he helped clear some debris from the dump. And he cleaned out the water reservoir tank? He done normal work, just like the rest of his dump. So how often? All the time. Well, if you didn't think you were supposed to be doing the work, why don't you say something? Hey, who am I to try and tell a foreman what he can or can't do? Well, what else did Earl do? Okay, he, he scraped out the dump with a wire brush, and then he swept out the tank. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thanks for the information. Now what I've got to try to do is get some information out of Mr. Cantrell. Right. Mike's done a good job so far. He's got three good witnesses who all testify they've seen the same thing. And they seem to be the kind of witnesses who will testify to what they saw if this case ever goes to arbitration. But now Mike's got a more difficult job, talking to the foreman, getting his side of the story. Hey, morning, Earl. Nice day, huh? Oh, what's so nice about it? Now, what do you want? Well, I'd like to talk to you just a minute about Elmer Crawford. Oh. He's been saying he did some classified work in the mine during vacation. He's not too happy about it. Look, all I did was help those boys out now and then when they needed a hand. Elmer bitches about everything. I did nothing wrong. All right, Earl. Could you just tell me what you did, okay? Yeah, I'll tell you what I did. I supervised those three men during vacation. Is that all? Well, I did do a few little things here and there, you know. But I didn't do three hours' work in the whole ten days. Well, thanks for the information, Earl. Yeah, yeah. You Good work, Mike. Now you've got both the miners and the foreman statements. Earl was the person to talk to to get his side of the story. Mike's done a good job of gathering the facts about the complaint from both sides. Facts which help him answer those six important questions. Who, what, when, where, why, how. Also, Mike needs to know the importance of record keeping. That is, keeping careful notes on all that he's learned. He can't rely on his memory of events and conversations. Mm -hmm. He should put everything in writing so he'll have his information handy if he needs it. As important as interviewing witnesses is, it's only part of the process which allows the steward to determine if a complaint is really a grievance or just a gripe. To continue and complete the investigation, the steward should talk to other members of the committee. 
In addition, the union field representative should be contacted to determine if the supposed grievance violates the agreement or is covered by arbitration decisions which have concerned similar cases in the past. Looks like Mike did talk to his field rep, Jerry Wysocki. In his conversation with Jerry, Mike learned that Section 1A, subsection C of the contract, provides that supervisory employees shall not perform classified work, except in emergencies, and except if such work is necessary for the purpose of training or instructing classified employees. Seems like Mike's about got this case sewed up as far as gathering the essential information you'll need to support the union's case. Now, though, he's got to evaluate all his information, review his notes, and decide whether to proceed with writing up the grievance. Let's see what's uh, going through Mike's mind now. I've got an important decision to make here, both for Elmer and the union. If I decide not to write up this grievance and just tell Elmer he doesn't have a chance, the company may start using the foreman to do more and more classified work. But if I do write it up, I may be in for more of a hassle than I want. But it's my job as mine committeeman to see that the union's workers are protected. And from what Jerry says and what I've heard from the witnesses, I think we got a good case here. It sure won't hurt to try. Decision. Now we have And we'll show you how that's done next. I don't know anything about writing up a grievance. Well, I'll just start writing it and hope for the best. Unfortunately, just writing up a grievance is not the best way to go about it. Could get Mike into trouble. But uh, let's see how well he does anyway. Hmm, let's see. Earl Cantrell. Out of work. Well, so much for that part of it. Now I gotta say something about what was violated. Okay, let's see. The company's and the foreman's actions violated the contract. That's short. I, I, I guess it's enough. Now I guess I better say something about the time of the occurrence. Okay, he did this during last vacation. Well, that about takes care of the details of this thing. Guess I'll just show it to Jerry Wasaki. Mike, this, this grievance is written all wrong. You can't do anything with it like this. Well, what's wrong with it? Well, it's too personal. It's too emotional. You've got to stick to the specific facts only, and you've got to remember to include the compensation remedy. This is no way to present the union's position. We'll, we're going to have to rewrite this. Uh, I thought that was going to happen. You see, there are some important things Mike has to remember when writing up a grievance that will stand. He has to stick to the facts, write the grievance formally in almost legal language, present only essential information, write the grievance up on the approved grievance form, and state the position of the union, including the remedy. Now, let's see what a grievance would look like if Mike remembered all of these points. The grievance, Elmer Crawford, has been treated unfairly by supervision in assigning work during vacation. By seniority, he should have performed the mechanics classified work that Earl Cantrell, the foreman, performed during vacation. Okay. All right. The foreman's action in this case violates the spirit of the collective bargaining agreement, including Article 1A, Section C of the National Bituminous Coal Wage Agreement. From July 16th, to July 26, the foreman performed classified work in addition to his supervisory duties. The union requests that the grievance be made whole and receive payment for 10 regular shifts. Mike's completed writing up Elmer's grievance, and he's done a good job. He stuck to the essential facts, 
filtered out the emotions and made it sound official. Now, there are a few more things I'd like you to consider when writing up a grievance. First of all, don't assume that you have to write up a grievance in every case. It's always better to try to settle a grievance through informal discussion. However, if you do have to write one up, thoroughly discuss the grievance with the grievant. Explain what you're doing and have the grievance sign the grievance. And remember, when you cite a specific article from the agreement, be sure to add a clause that says article such and such and uh, any other article that may apply. This will cover you in the event that a situation arises which you weren't aware of when you wrote the grievance. Write your grievance on the assumption that it may be presented to a neutral third party. When you're writing up your grievance, don't limit the union's position to a single section of the agreement. Consider all applicable sections. In other words, keep your options open. And finally, always remember that writing concisely can help clarify your thinking about a case. Now, of course, you management people are dealing with the same problems and need to follow the same principles we've been talking about. the big deal about all this. It doesn't really matter, right? Hey, wait a minute. Wait just one minute. Oh, are you chickening out on me? Nah, that ain't it, Mike. I was just thinking that, well, I mean, it seems like we're making such a big production out of all this. We got a big meeting in the super's office with witnesses and everything. This makes me nervous. Hey, this is a step two meeting. This maybe is, is the most important part of the whole grievance procedure. And why? Now, why? Because this is a chance to stick it to those big deal management types. I've been waiting for a crack at Foster, and this is my chance. Yeah, but do you think that's going to make the girl Cantrell stop stealing our work? Hey, if you think either Cantrell or Foster is just going to lay down and give in on this one, no way. Ain't that the truth? You know, the only way to handle them guys is to be just as hard-nosed as they are. Don't you understand that, Elmer? I guess so. I don't know. You're the mind committee, Mike. I don't know. I'm going to tell him just like it is, huh? Well, don't worry. They're going to get an earful. Count on me. Just like when I ask you for your vote, okay? Okay. It's your ball game, Mike. You damn right. I can't wait. The night before Mike Duncan's step two meeting, he's celebrating. Well, I can see his viewpoint, I guess. It's a heady thing to go in and confront management, the big boss, the old rock himself, face to face. <laughs> I'd have thought, though, uh, maybe Mike would want to spend a little time preparing himself and his witnesses. Well, apparently, Mike feels as prepared as he feels uh, thirsty. <laughs> he certainly feels confident. Figures he's really going to put it to management tomorrow. Poor old management. I, I guess he'll just roll over and play dead, huh? And Mike will get his way, right? You seem uncertain. Maybe you're questioning Mike's attitude, his whole approach. Well, let's see how accurate you Right now, it's time for that step. As Rocky Foster, the superintendent, and Mike Duncan, the other two mine committee men, and his witnesses. I wonder about Mike, though. He uh, seems to have lost some of his crusading fervor. <laughs> In fact, that boy doesn't look well at all. Mm -hmm. So much for the preparations. The meeting's about to get rolling now. Okay. Let's get this over with. Now, Earl here says it's a bunch of you-know-what about him doing classified work. 
Uh, now, look, other than just help out here and there in a pinch, you know? Duncan, I think what we got here is your regular old put-up job. Oh, put-up job? Now, be honest. Huh? Isn't that the truth? Hey, we might as well get something straight, you know, right from the beginning. The job is what we're fighting for. Right. And the yeah. job is what your foreman stole from us. Right. Right. Exactly right. And this job belongs to this union and this grievance. And you can't have it. None of it. Do I make myself clear? Perfectly clear. Hey, you see the kind of crap that comes out when a union hasn't got any case? <laughs> but the agreement says we're supposed to have these meetings. So we're having a meeting. You know, we come here looking for justice, and all we get is excuses. Looks that way. Hey, we got you dead to rights this time, and you know it. I guess I can't blame you for not wanting to discuss it in a reasonable manner. Discussion, huh? You call this a discussion? Marching in here with a chip on your shoulder. Hey, you're new at this. You'll burn something. Hey, Foster, we don't have to knuckle under to you now or ever. Huh? We'll just take this little affair to a level where we can get some justice, huh? Yeah, you, you just do that. Hmm. I always wondered what they did in these problem-solving meetings. You know, the give and take, the logical argument, the compromise, and statesmanlike demeanor. What's that? You didn't notice a lot of statesmanlike demeanor? <laughs> you may have a point. Now, let's see what Mike Duncan thinks about it. Hey, uh, Mike, does this mean I don't get my pay? Oh, no, no. It, it just means that we're going to have to take those uh, money grubbers to step three. No, gee, man. Hey, don't worry about it, Elmer. We'll get them in step three. We did our best. Uh, yeah, you did your best. Come on. It seems as though Elmer wasn't nearly as interested in getting them as he was in protecting his right to certain kinds of work and maybe picking up a couple of extra bucks because management violated that right. <laughs> <laughs>